So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. And it's really a, pl a pleasure to welcome you to this semester's uh, Women of Yale lecture. Uh, we began this series uh, a couple of years ago to showcase the accomplishments of women who graduated from Yale. And our guests, including our distinguished speaker today, uh, uh, Kiara uh, Hudes, um, represent the very best of this university. And they reflect the remarkable success of uh, co-education uh, at Yale. Um, my wife, Marta Barrett, who is also a woman of Yale, a 1984 graduate of our public health school, she's actually the one who first proposed the idea of a speaker series that would bring back to Yale uh, some of the most uh, uh, inspiring women. And to do it in this year, or leading up to this year, the year in which we celebrate the 50th anniversary of co-education in Yale, in Yale College. Uh, and it's been a fantastic way to meet and hear from some of our most brilliant and accomplished alumni. These events have been able, have allowed us to commemorate the legacy of women at this university, to learn about their leadership, their contributions to society. And you'll recall our first speaker was Maya Lin, a pioneering architect who graduated from Yale College in 1981, earned her master's degree from the School of Architecture in 1986, and returned uh, a year later to receive an honorary Doctor of Fine Arts degree from Yale. After that, we welcomed Vera Wells, who is here today, uh, sitting right here. Uh, she was a member of the class of 1971, the first Yale College graduating class to include women, and she was the recipient of the Yale Medal for service to the university. And then we honored uh, Anita Hill, a lawyer, scale, trailblazer, and uh, a uh, scholar and advocate for women's rights. She graduated from the Yale Law School in 1980. And then last year, we heard from Dr. Patricia Nez Henderson. She is the first Native American woman to graduate from the Yale School of Medicine, and she earned her master's degree in public health from Yale uh, as well. So as we celebrate these women pioneers, we need to remember that actually women have been at Yale as students longer than the 50 years in Yale College. The School of Art, when it first opens its doors 150 years ago, women and men studied together. So it's fitting that we, we welcome today uh, Kiara Hudes, who was a 1999 graduate of Yale College, but is a playwright and author from West Philly with roots in Puerto Rico and Boricua. Uh, uh, and he, she shows us, uh, and, uh, because she studies it and practices it, uh, the importance of arts uh, in our world. Uh, her plays and musicals, I don't have to tell you about them. They've been performed around the world. They include Elliot, A Soldier's Fugue, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, uh, Water by the Spoonful, winner of the 2012 Pulitzer Prize for Drama, and the Tony Award-winning Broadway hit, In the Heights. We were actually uh, talking before uh, uh, the, uh, this program about uh, our family. She lives in the Heights, and uh, I have an uncle who was in the Heights, and my nephew lives in the Heights, and so sharing tales of, of the neighborhood. Charles Isherwood of the New York Times described In the Heights as a panoramic portrait of a New York neighborhood filled with Spanish-speaking dreamers of American dreams nervously eyeing their futures from a city block on the cusp of change. Ms. Hudes has adapted her award-winning work for the screen, and it is uh, in release uh, this summer, right, uh, at uh, movie theaters all across the country. Um, her most recent musical, Miss You Like Hell, ran off-Broadway at the Public Theater, and she has written a memoir, which will be published next year by One World Random House. She's the co-founder of Emancipated Stories, a platform for incarcerated people to share their stories through writing and art. And we are so grateful that you are here with us today. So grateful that you share your story uh, with us. Today, she will speak to us about art and disruption. And I ask you to join me in welcoming Kiara Hudes. 
you for doing this. Very really appreciate it. All right. Hello. How y'all doing? Um, I'm tempted to start by going off script and see who would be willing. Let's, let's get a little physical for a second. So two parts to this, because this is going to be like a bedtime story that I'm about to do, even though it's before everyone's bedtime. But um, so it's hard to give a bedtime story that far back. So if anyone feels compelled to come a little bit closer to me so I can kind of like look you in the eye while telling this bedtime story, I would welcome that. No pressure. If you're comfortable, stay where you are. But if you want to come up so I can really connect with you, um, the closer the better. Um, so I'll give you a moment to do that, but then I'm going to ask everyone also wherever you are to get a little physical. <laughs> Ooh, it means people are sitting closer to each other. I like this. And I'm going to be doing a Q&A at the end of my remarks. So if anything, any thoughts come up um, that you're interested in discussing, I know there's some students here who are interested in incarceration topics, possibly. You know, just things that come to mind, just flag it, because we'll have time to, um, to open up the conversation at the end. Um, OK. so. I think before I start, I learned this from an activist I met in Philadelphia. I'm going to turn off my mic. Um, I, just to connect us in the room, I'm going to ask everyone to start by screaming. I, not, not so that you hurt your throat, not so that you hurt your neighbor, but <laughs> just, just to give the room our energy as a collective, to just be energetic in the room together. I know it sounds a little strange. I'm going to join you in the scream. So um, I think seated is OK. I don't want to ask you all to do too much. Um, but, but if you'll take the leap of faith, it's not going to like blow anyone's ears out. It's actually almost like a, a strange sort of like prayer or something. Um, cool? You guys trust me enough to give it a try? So we're just going to scream for a second, all right? <laughs> All right, ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Ah! Whew, thank you. All right, let me turn my mic back on. Okay, so here we go. Um, wait, am I? Okay, got a lot of mics. So. so this thing I'm about to do called Art and Disruption is based on years of conversations with Corey Menefee here in New Haven over the last four years, but mostly in 2016. I paraphrased just a tiny amount, and the only editing is for clarity and continuity. Corey's here, and I want to thank him from the bottom of my heart. The rest of my presentation is pulled right out of my life, so I took liberties with that, but it's all true. Also, shouting out Andrea Olivares, who designed my PowerPoint slides. It's mostly art from children's books that she messed with, um, that she broke or disrupted. So art and disruption. All right, so I thought I'd tell a tale. Spin a yarn, kind of like circle time, story hour, a night-night book about an ordinary guy and an ordinary girl. Came of age in the 80s and 90s listening to some of the tunes you heard while walking in. He from the African-American hill section of New Haven, she from West Philly and North Philly, El Barrio, Puerto Rico and Philadelphia, and a moment that they crossed paths at Yale. I even went Aesop style and wrote a moral at the end of the story. So that was actually my prologue. <laughs> Let's go. OK. Once upon a time, a child named Corey lived on Orchard Street, but would hang on Kensington. Then he moved to Sheffield Ave, then Lake Place, where his family had more room. Every three to five years, Corey moved to a different house. On those New Haven streets, Corey would ride bikes, play basketball, get up with his buddies, young, carefree, going with the flow. 
At four or five or six, he took to the New York Giants because blue was his favorite color. Or because he was watching with his grandfather and older uncles, who were all Giants fans. Either way, he loved all teams that wore blue. Michigan football, the Mets, Hill House High. He always rooted for Hill House over Cross. For winter holidays, his family split into two sides. On one side, his mother's mother's branch was, how to put this, middle class. You wore your good shirt and tie. You sat around the table and said a prayer. And if there was, was music playing, it was violins. You ate Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner at one or two in the afternoon. Then he would go to the Menifee side, to Pow Pow's. His father's father was Pow Pow. That side was more urban. He'd put on his jeans and hoodie. There was gonna be loud music, dancing, playing spades, yelling and screaming over the moves. On July 4th, they would get up before sunrise and go to Wharton Brook, both sides of the family together. Corey would stay guarding the picnic table while the elders parked and unpacked the food. There was always a deck of cards for playing spades, running back and forth to the beach, rolling down dirt hills. That's how Corey passed the time with the other kids. Stuff that now he's like, man, that was dumb. His two grandmothers plus Aunt Gladys cooking the day away. His mom was on macaroni and cheese duty. Pow Pow worked the grill. There would always be a pot of rice, cabbage or string beans, chicken or pork chops, a baked ham, sweet potatoes, cornbread, lasagna, the whole works. After his mom's vision went, Corey became her eyes in the kitchen. That's how he learned to cook. Elbows, extra sharp cheddar, a stick of butter, two eggs, American cheese. But to this day, his mac and cheese never comes out quite the same the love she put into it. Caring and sympathetic, nice, kind-hearted, but she'd cut, cuss your ass out in a heartbeat. A strong, spirited woman. That was his mom's personality. He became independent like her, not liking to depend on nobody for nothing. History and social studies were his best subjects because it's a matter of memorization. You just cram the facts into your brain. The school laid out two possible paths. You could be like W.E.B. Du Bois, who believed that black people should take on professional roles like doctor, professor, lawyer. They should use their mind to give back, a mindset Corey would embrace years later at college. Or you could be a Booker T. Washington guy, cast your buckets down here, learn a trade, gain practical skills. After college in his 20s, he would become a Booker T. guy. Corey, it was said, possessed an ability Pow Pow had. He could walk with kings and bums alike. Plus, he got Pow Pow's comedic intelligence. Being in a bad mood around Corey was hard. In second grade, the teacher called his mom and said, Corey does his work. He's a good student, but he's the class clown. He likes to goof around. Well, his mom came into school and whooped him right there with all the kids laughing. She gave away his lunchbox and his backpack. She and Corey lived with Pow Pow at the time and he kicked her out for a minute. He was mad, but she had high expectations of her son. When Corey was 10, his mom got pregnant. As a diabetic, she was put on strict bed rest. It was on Corey to do things now. Push a cart full of clothes down the hill, learn how to operate a washing machine at the laundromat, bring the list of groceries and money to the store and do the shopping. When she went into labor, the doc said, this baby's gonna die too. See, Corey's sister had been premature and died at birth. His brother, William, also premature, died at birth. But this time the docs were wrong. Corey became a big brother, the love of his life. That's what Mitchell became. Corey fed him, changed him, handed him off to a girl to go play street ball. His mom would say, I had Mitchell just for you. But if Corey was bad, she'd make threats. You're out of my will. You're not getting Mitch. <laughs> Seventh grade, girls began to develop. Corey fell in love with a different one every day. A girl would randomly smile, say hello, and Corey would think, oh my God, I love her. 
He had no skills whatsoever, but high aspirations. And the girls that liked him, he didn't like them back. So he went to the eighth grade dance alone. In high school, he was a brain. Biggie Smalls, Wu-Tang, that's what he liked. His hillside friends let him hang, but pushed him aside when it came to, came to extremes. Drugs, beefing, the Trey guys, they'd always be beefing with Hillside. Nah, this ain't for you, his friends said. They could have seduced him into it, but they had that type of love for him. But once, walking home at one in the morning, he ran into some, guy he, some guys he knew. A Trey guy was like, where are you from? Corey said, the hill. Guy had a gun on him. Said, you should run. But Corey, being young and cocky, was like, I ain't gonna run. Just walking away slowly. Stop, shots started going off, one ricocheted off his shoe. This guy was shooting everything but Corey. Then was like, turn around, turn around. And when Corey did, he put that gun right up on Corey's chest. Click. He had run out of bullets. Later that night, Corey was just thanking God. Counting the bullet holes in his pants. The, the style was real baggy back then. It dawned on Corey, he really tried to shoot me. Duh. That's how he learned. Don't go around saying you're from any neighborhood, since he didn't have something on his hip to protect him. Instead of beefing, he went to play practice, cast as Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird, <laughs> missing rehearsal only for football practice, even though he stunk. To quote him, I had a mixed skill set that didn't relate to success on the field. He could catch, but he wasn't fast. He was a very undersized offensive lineman. Anyone after two or three years of this, going to practice every day faithfully, not getting any playtime, would have quit. But Corey stuck with it. He loved football. Later in life, if he said he played in high school, his uncle would correct him. You were on the team. <laughs> Senior prom. This time he had a date. Last dance of the night was Keith Sweat, make it last forever. College tuition would be tight. His mother had been a home health aide, what they called private duty. She had worked 11 through seven, then at a factory, but she became disabled, the result of juvenile diabetes. She lost a toe, went blind, seeing only blurry shapes and light. With no money in his pocket, Corey headed down to Virginia Union University. Stole books from the bookstore. Went homeless for an entire semester. Meaning he was an off-campus student, meaning he couldn't eat in the dining hall. So he would steal from grocery stores. Things he wasn't proud of. But the journalism major taught him to write, to choose a subject, to qualify the story and talk to both, both parties, tell it from both aspects. Graduation came in the early aughts the same year his mom died. The night before her passing, she coughed and sneezed really hard. She went to the bathroom on herself. Okay, so not number two, just wet. He said, I have to change you. She resisted, wanted to rest. He said, all right. Next morning, she was unresponsive. Sugar level, almost on a coma. Corey called an ambulance. And while they came, he changed his mother's underwear. That's a very hard thing for a man to do. No man wants to change his mother's underwear, but she couldn't go to the emergency room like that. Four years. That's how long it took Corey to read the Bible, cover to cover. He set a goal and accomplished it. Finished in June of 2015. Admittedly, he skipped around a little bit, his favorite verse was Philippians, chapter 4, verse 13. Anyone know that one? I can do all things through Christ, for it is he who strengthens me. He told me, you can read something and you can even comprehend what it's saying, but until it applies to your life, you don't know. For example, he was going over to Whitney Avenue to bid on a Yale dining hall job. He had to be at work at Davenport by 11.30, but by the time he finished his bid paperwork, it was already 11.15. Mind you, he walks with a limp from a long ago car accident. And he was like, how am I gonna get there? So he recited the verse 
and started walking. I can do all things through Christ, for it is he who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ, for it is me who strengthens me, for it is he who strengthens me. He swiped in at 11.30 precisely. From the get-go, when his mother-in-law introduced him to her manager, the Yale job felt like family and the pay was good. Take out the trash, work in the dish room, keep the floors clean, compost, that is separate the food waste from the other trash. Sometimes doing the same task for weeks and weeks gets stale, so every once in a while the workers would switch it up. Often they shared a family meal, sat down together and ate the food that they had cooked. Healthy meals, vegan dishes, a salad bar, and Corey being diabetic, that worked for him. The backbone of Yale University, that's how he described his coworkers. Without staff and those behind the scenes, the university couldn't thrive. There'd be chaos if the students came to eat and we weren't there, Corey said, and he loved the work. One simple, hi, how you doing, could mean a big difference to a student. Seeing people every day, they opened up. He was invited to a gospel choir performance at Patel Chapel. Tired at the end of his shift, he wanted to go home. Instead, after a hard day of work, the gospel choir was refreshing. The girl who invited him was in tears, told him, I view you as a father figure. He knew some of these students were thousands of miles away from everyone they knew and loved. He remembered being in their shoes at Virginia Union, that they might not have anyone around to reassure them. So that being able to open up, say, yeah, it's been a hard week, it might help them. We have a lot of fun at work, Corey told me, but our main concern is to attend to students, and I take that very seriously, he said. Oh, and one more detail before I end part one of this story. When Corey was 16, Miss Maniello, his Spanish teacher, held him after class. She said, Corey, you're a straight kid. You follow the rules. One day, you're gonna have to learn how to break a rule. His mother always instilled, do the right thing, and now an authority figure was like, learn to break a rule. His mind was blown. Once upon a time, there was a place called Yale. Beautiful buildings were connected by stone paths, cast iron gates, and border walls of sturdy masonry. Each room was full of many curious hearts, souls hungry to learn. Yale owned so many gorgeous buildings and artworks that one might say beauty was its property. Sterling Library alone had 2,000 unique stained glass or printed glass panels, fitting for an institution whose Latin motto meant truth and light. Reunion weekend, 2016. A Sunday in May, 11.30 a.m. The Calhoun dining staff had completed its work for the day cleaning up after the reunions ended. Corey was thinking, should I leave now and take half a day because the shift was supposed to end at three? He thought, well, stay till 12 to make it an even number. That's when the knock came at the door. No one wanted to open it, they had already finished up. But Corey relented. Standing there was an African-American man alongside a girl of about 10. The stranger said, hi, I used to be a student here. Can I show my daughter where I used to eat? Corey let him in. There in the empty dining hall, the alumnus started telling his daughter about the removal of names, how in his undergrad years, African-American students like himself wanted the name Calhoun removed from the college. Explaining to his daughter how John C. Calhoun grew up in the late 1700s, believing what his daddy told him, that slavery was a moral good. Traveling from the South up to attend Yale, how in the US Senate he opposed abolition and passionately led the pro-slavery legislative agenda, views he took to the White House as Secretary of State, then Vice President. Father told daughter these things. In this empty dining hall, Corey and the workers heard and at times joined in, the stranger welcomed this. He explained how in his undergraduate years, Yale had removed Calhoun's stained glass portrait not the whole thing, just the part where an African-American man in shackles knelt at Calhoun's feet. Then father led daughter to the small stained glass windows. They went in sequence, he explained. First, 
a picture of a tree. Next, a house. Next, enslaved people picking cotton. Corey thought, no, they don't show that. I've been working here a long time. I ain't seen nothing like that. But the father invited Corey to check it out, this window beneath which he had eaten his college meals. You see, the windows are small and a little high up, and Corey's vision is blurry, just like his mother before him, also from diabetes. Corey needed glasses, still does. So Corey leaned in close and saw it for the first time. African Americans with cotton bales on their head, one of them smiling, looking peaceful. Corey was like, oh, that can't be here. That's not right. No, no, no. Because it was deliberate that these were African American people, one with a smile on her face. After that, when Corey came into work, it was staring at him, eating away at his subconscious. Like you think someone's watching you, that feeling of eyes on your back, eyes on your shoulders, eyes on your neck. A week later, Corey thought, that thing has to come down. It was God's work, not planned or premeditated. All he wanted was to get a paycheck and take care of his family. But instead, he went and found a broomstick, climbed up on a heater, and smashed the window panel. 27 pieces of glass fell into the moat outside, the grassy part separating the wall from the sidewalk. Inside, an old lady said, ooh, ooh. The production manager was like, dude, you just destroyed Yell's property. Corey said, it looks a lot better now. <laughs> then headed for the locker room. When he was scruffy, people often disengaged. But when he was clean shaven and made eye contact, people would say hi first. So he went and shaved as the authorities searched the building for him. A coworker came into the locker room like, our general manager is looking for you. Corey said, I bet she is. The authorities questioned him. He was composed, honest. Corey told me, I'm a stand up person. I really despise liars. I don't understand why people lie all the time. He didn't try to cover anything. He accepted responsibility. The sergeant said, yo, son, I'm going to have to slap cuffs on you for this. Corey put out his wrist, calm, and said, OK, here you go, as the two arresting officers were joined by 15 more to investigate the scene. Corey went to jail. Resign from the job. That was the union rep's advice. Corey agreed to never pursue Yale for a hostile work environment. Yale agreed not to seek reparations for their destroyed property. And for emphasis, I, Kiara, will add an editorial repeat. Property. Property. Corey signed his letter of resignation and said, OK, I'll move on with my life. He didn't want a felony hanging over his head for breaking a window. The rest is a matter of public record, court record, and Googleable. He lost his job, was charged with a felony, given a promise to appear, released after three hours in custody. His family was all down on him. His baby brother, Mitch, was like, how could you be so stupid to let a picture on the wall cause you to lose your job? Until Corey's phone started ringing. Area codes from Texas, North Carolina. It's such and such from Fox News, from NBC, from Democracy Now. After the media frenzy, he went from being the biggest dumbass in the family to yeah, maybe it was good that you did that. <laughs> Still, they wanted Corey to do two things. One, offer a letter of apology. Two, cry his soul out and beg for his job back. About the second, he told me, no. About the first, he wrote a five-sentence letter of apology. Using these skills, he'd let deteriorate throughout the years, expressing each sentence, line by line, the word choice, the narrative description, he hadn't written since college. There was a big picture of what he wanted to say. I'm sorry for what I did. Now he had five sentences to paint the picture. Here's two of them. Quote, I want to express remorse for my barbaric actions. Yale College, I truly do love all of you. End quote. Off it went to Calhoun College. But then he wondered, barbaric action? Really? Yes and no. If you destroy something, that's barbaric. And it was never a good idea to destroy property. 
But if he was in that situation a million times, he'd probably do the same thing. A cause, a movement, was already in place that had stagnated. The students had been protesting for months, years actually, in truth decades, to change the name. If Yale didn't listen to the student body, why were they going to listen to a blue-collar worker? And I promise you, Corey told me, if I had just said something, the image would still be there today. Soon, Yale dropped the term master for a new one, head of college. Soon, Yale renamed Calhoun College to Hopper. Corey told me, it makes you wonder why something so easily resolved becomes so complex. It's almost as though you want the name, the negative buzz. He told me it was an oppressive image that a lot of people felt ill about seeing. On July 26, 2016, I attended Corey's second criminal hearing. Out on the courthouse steps, Black Lives Matter was present. Latinos Unidos en Acción was present, chanting, change the name, change the name. Going through security, I saw one guard handing out coffees to her crew. The hell are they doing out there, one asked. Well, there's a whole bunch of protesters out there chanting it, she replied. Hats off in the courtroom, the court officer called. On one bench, a bug-eyed dude rambled about his cigarette addiction. The stenographer complained about the judge's tardiness. Sometimes he doesn't come out till after 11, she said. That's why I shouldn't have put my money in the meter. <laughs> On another bench, Corey sat, unmoving, the gate of anticipation. The docket began, first a second degree burglary, next a violation of a protective order. Guilty pleas were logged, so noted, so ordered, and next all criminal charges against Corey were dropped. When Corey walked out, about half the courtroom stood and left with him. Deans and students had been there all morning in quiet support. Outside, people had posters and banners with his name on it. Posters that said, Menifee equals Rosa Parks. News cameras and reporters pounced. Do you want your job back? One asked, and a protester shouted, no, he doesn't want a job from that racist institution. Corey went on record then and there. I want my job back. Soon, Yale went on record too. If he wants his job back, we'd love to have him. That's how his dining hall position was reinstated through the press. That summer, Corey attended the Hillside reunion like usual. One friend said, hey man, come over here. Yo, what you did, man? We're gonna give you a clap for that. We're gonna give you some recognition. Walking the streets of New Haven, Corey got nods and thumbs up from folks, even from police. Little kids, I wanna thank you, you're a hero. When he returned to Yale, a stranger approached. It's good to have you back. A dining hall manager, I don't agree with what you did, but as a white man, I respect what you did. I understand why you did it. A passerby, hey, you're the guy who broke the glass. Oh man, I appreciate what you did. A young lady at Styles, where he now worked, you're so awesome. And to me, as we sat in a dark bar having the conversations that led to this tale, he said, students had been protesting for months, years, about the Calhoun name. Just break it. You can't live in fear of doing things. Once upon a time, había una vez y dos son tres. There was a girl named Chiara who grew up in Philly loving art. Museum art and fancy stuff, sure, but street art especially. She had an aunt who played neoclassical punk at CBGB and would sneak her into gigs, though she was only five. As her aunt put on thick, bad-to-the-bone eyeliner, the girl was hypnotized by the vandalized dressing room. There was a neighbor, Adi Mukumba, who made instruments out of garbage, performed street concerts by the tracks on 49th and Baltimore. No venue or cover price, just a kalimba, a thumb piano, made out of an old discarded bustelo can. Two teenagers dropped a snare on a West Philly street corner and started rapping. It was catchy, repeated on loop in the girl's head. It looks like another one's coming around. Past the what? Past the popcorn. Years later, she heard it on Power 99 FM, a group called The Roots. <laughs> Rennie Harris would produce Illadelph Legends, showing school kids Mr. Wiggles, Crazy Legs, Don Campbell. They'd be popping, locking, whacking, voguing, and breaking. The girl, like all her classmates, got how breaking was creation. 
Graffiti popped up everywhere, prettying up broken walls, uglying up pretty walls. Street legends like Karaz and Cornbread, but the girl didn't know it then. She couldn't make out all the letters, only that a whole lot of them read RIP, clear as day. Keith Herring defacement became pins on the girl's backpack. She saw Kathy Change dance on the art museum steps or over by the 38th Street Bridge. Peace signs on her flags and face. Passers-by laughed at the dancing fool. Cops arrested her for breaking the peace. When the dancing fool set herself aflame before the peace statue, when she self-immolated as her final performance, the girl grieved. So many after schools, the girl walked to West Coast Video and rented the same VHS tape, Do the Right Thing. She screamed when Sal smashed Radio Rahim's boombox to shards. So that this girl grew up thinking the purpose of art was literally to break things now. Seeing art that often led to arrest, surrounded by art crimes. It was the 80s and 90s when crack and AIDS decimated her abuela's barrio. It was a savage time, an uncertain time. They were skeleton years. It was a mayhem epoch. Around the girl, bodies were breaking. Buildings and city blocks were breaking. T-cells were breaking. Runaway daddies left a trail of the brokenhearted. Broken window was the name of the police strategy. The art of the time did not romanticize this girl's world, but made something powerful by reporting the chaos, by reflecting the era's rupture. To this girl, art was transformation not in the gooey kumbaya sense, but in the most igniting conflictual sense. Art was a hammer smashing the material world, smashing the picket fence fairy tales she saw on TV. And the girl found solace in that smashing because there is consolation in truthfulness, even through the discomfort. And in all that broken creation, she discovered deeply that she was not alone. She wasn't alone mourning three family members felled by AIDS. She wasn't alone missing cousins who disappeared to addiction or prostitution or prison. She wasn't alone thinking she was a zero because daddy left. She wasn't alone being blinded with rage when her cuz was blinded by a bullet. The girl loved the honesty of the breaking. It made new life where there had been dereliction. Then she went to Yale. Then she graduated. Then her plays went to Broadway. She won prizes. And it was easy to mistake the prestige, a Yale degree, international stages, awards, for moral soundness and spiritual success, to think that she had done her work. Some of her plays were honest, some decent or even good, though she was never sure. Some she knew, but didn't admit, were too well behaved. By this time, she had long since become a woman. When the girlhood had left and the womanhood had dropped in, she couldn't pinpoint. But during those womanhood becoming years, one cousin's HIV became undetectable. Another cousin thrived in the long haul of recovery. The blind cousin learned Braille and got a PhD. Sure, prison had claimed a few of the rising young generation. But crack cocaine's grip on the barrio loosened. In fact, her Boricua cousin in recovery now cooked free meals for opioid addicts, who were pretty much all white, beneath the same tracks she used to go copping, walking their city tent, serving arroz con gandules out her car trunk, thinking, there but for the grace of God go I. The woman's family was, perhaps, less broken now. The less brokenness brought tremendous relief. It brought true peace. But it was easy to conflate the less brokenness with moral soundness and spiritual success, to think they had all done their work. Then one day, the woman read how Cory Menefee shattered a window, decorative stained glass showing slavery as a noble history. And the little girl within her awoke the one who knew of broken things. And the woman, for she had become a woman now, wondered if she would be brave enough to commit that simple act, 
to break a small window at an institution that she benefited from. So she took a train to New Haven to attend a criminal court hearing and asked Corey Menefee for permission for the honor of hearing more and telling it. And then I nervously wrote these words to read to you, you room full of strangers whom I see with love tonight. And I wrote these words to Corey, you, Corey, right there, whom I see with love and also the complication reserved for those I respect the most. This is my thank you letter slash Aesop's fable for you. The moral of the story is that in institutions that own beauty, that value pedigree and decorum, your truth, you out there today, your truth may be a beautiful disruption. The moral of the story is that there is no guidebook or checklist. No great wise leader will say, go, now is the time for breaking. You are the guidebook and the checklist. You are the leader. The time to disrupt is a matter of your gut, your integrity, your grace. The moral of the story is, as you exist in and beyond Yale and carry the fraught, vaunted name into true and false powers, remember to exist on your own terms, not on anyone else's. The moral of the story is, what was the real stain on the stained glass window? And now that the window is broken, is the real stain removed? The moral of the story is, Corey created an empty rectangle where more light could flow. Truth through enlightenment, lux et veritas. By breaking Yale, he bettered Yale. The end. I was going to do a Q&A um, and see if anyone had questions. And maybe, since Corey's willing and close by, if anyone, would you feel comfortable answering any questions? Questions for either myself or Corey could be about this topic or about whatever's on your mind. Um, I think there were supposed to be microphones, but I don't see them. So if we have microphones. OK, great. Um, so if anyone has any questions, Let's, let's chat what's on people's minds. There's one microphone over there. Oh, and one here. Sandy has one. Don't be shy. We all screamed together, remember? <laughs> Corey, what are you doing right now? What am I doing right now? Oh, I'm a head of GSA at Ezra Styles Morris College. Yo, Donnie. Yeah. yeah, you had a question? Um, this is a question for, well, mostly you, Kiara. Um, but so about a week ago, I, I attended a talk with Angela Davis, and she talked about how art, specifically music, can be a way of healing, mm -hmm. um, especially in times of like burning out and just like uh, and disrupting and like the emotional toll that, that can have on students. Um, how do you see like art as a way of like, in in your terms of like breaking it and sort of like breaking things that we're accustomed to as a sort of like healing. So the question was about, here Corey, you wanna come hang at the podium with me? Um, so the, the question was about um, art, at music in particular, having healing qualities and what's the relationship between those healing qualities and the disrupt, disruptive qualities of art. And, um, you know, I've thought a lot about that, and I actually was going to put in here something about um, the healing legacy that I come from, 
but I didn't because I thought it went a little bit off topic. Um, but I'll say this. I think about, I also come from um, an agricultural and a gardening legacy. And what I have learned from the elder women in my family, some of whom are no longer with us, that they learned from their elders um, was about the tool that we call a hoe, right? So a hoe is, um, it has like, it's on like a mop handle and it's got a blade at the end of it and you literally break the earth, right? Um, and you break the earth in order to create troughs, narrow troughs where what goes in the troughs? Seeds. And so I think this relationship between breaking and healing isn't necessarily dichotomous. I think um, it's sym symbiotic and circular. And so I think the same music that can be disruptive can also be healing. And I know music has healed me my entire life. I and mean, one of the reasons that I asked Corey about what music he was listening to as a kid because I knew it would be a way for me to just understand, get into his life, get into his mind, you know, that, and I wrote about some of the music that I was listening to, too. Does that make sense? Corey? Um, did you know what the story was today, or was that the first time you're hearing it, or how do you feel about hearing your story? Well, I was a little, uh, a little emotional. I got a little teary-eyed. I, I, I kind of covered it up. Because, <laughs> well, she's talking about events that actually happened in my life. And not so much the whole thing with the glass breaking thing, but prior to, you know, as you live life and you, you grow and you develop, develop, you tend to forget certain things that, and how, how you felt at that time about certain things that happened in your life. And just hearing her mention, you know, Fourth of July, my family getting together at Wharton Brook, both sides of my family, everybody in harmony, nobody arguing, nobody pointing finger, everybody just having a good time. You know, those, that's back to my childhood and being 41, you know, you tend to forget what it was like when you were seven because you get caught up in your, your daily grind of this and that and that. And it, it, was just, it was just humbling to hear her speak about my childhood and different things that I went through growing up. So, um, no, I didn't know exactly what she was going to say, but uh, it was good to hear her. It was definitely good. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process that you went through in terms of um, just like generating this fable and just sort of like how you went about asking questions and that, that work of it? And then also just how this relates to um, your work as a playwright and how that intersects with this story. Sure. So, um, well, one point that Corey and I spoke about last week was how the the students who were freshmen during this event are now going to graduate this year. Um, and so next year it will be a completely new group of students. We were just wondering, you know, what, what does the story mean when it's a totally new group of students? Um, anyway, that's a bit of a tangent, but basically, as I mentioned in the story, it really blew up in the media. Corey was, his lawyer Patricia is here today, and I think she helped like set him up with the phone so that he could field all these interviews at the time. And so that's how I heard about it. I heard about it in the press. Actually, it wasn't me who heard about it. It was my husband, and he called me from work. Um, and he's a public defender, so he was he's like interested in matters of like the criminal court. And um, so he called me. He was like, "This happened. This is going to be your next play. This is what you have to write about." And so I was like, "Oh, okay. So let me check it out." And um, <laughs> And um, so I checked it out, and he was like, the hearing is like in two days. You have to go up, you have to go up. And so I went up, and I was like, am I allowed to go in? So he, he was like, yeah, you can go. And I don't, you know, I, Corey gave this interview on Democracy Now. If, if, it's a really interesting interview, and I, that's how I started to learn. His, his action became a gateway for me to learn more about the history of slavery with the American College um, system and with Ivy League schools. Um, there was a scholar on there talking about, about the history who was very knowledgeable in the history, so I went and read his book. And I saw that interview, and to me, Corey was magnetic. I was just like, I like him. 
I want to meet him. I want to look him in the eye. I just want to see how this proceeding goes. So I went up and um, I, I've taken a little break from playwriting now, but I was like in the thick of it then. And so I was like, I was nervous. One of the first things I talked about with Corey was, you know, I'm a light skinned Latina. You know, you're a black man. We're connected by this institution. Like, how do we feel about me interviewing you and writing the story? And we had those sort of conversations. Corey seemed less nervous about that component than I was. Um, so we planned to write a play. And um, four years later, you know, this is what came of those conversations. I came up to New Haven a few times. We had some meals. I was really just interested in like what his life was like, just conversations. The thing I love about playwriting is I, I always write like this, but I've never done it outside of my family. This is the first time I've written outside of my family in terms of I'm just sitting down with Titi Ginny or Theo George and being like, so tell me about how you got interested in gardening. And then a whole history of someone's life opens up in a way that would never have in casual conversation. If you didn't sit someone down and say, I just want to listen to you for a few hours, are you cool with that? So this was, and still feels new for me, you know? Um, and then I guess Corey and I can like chat on the phone tomorrow and see what we thought and where we might want to take it from here. Um, I thought it, I have a commission from Lincoln Center Theater and so I thought it would be a kind of wild topic to bring. That's a very, very, it's like one of the wealthiest theater audiences in New York and I've been really nervous to write a play for them because I don't know, it's, in theater it can be very weird to have like a super wealthy audience watching some of the topics I deal with. It feels like there's a dissonance and it can be very disturbing to me, but then I was like, well, maybe this is an opportunity to really actually engage that dissonance and be speaking directly to that audience. And anyway, that, those are some of the ramblings <laughs> of it. Do, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, not really. Uh... It's, it's just uh, fascinating to me how, how people are interconnected, you know. Yale University is our common link, but if you read more into it, we both have a lot of similarities in our upbringing and the lives we live, you know. So it's just interesting to, it's interesting to see how people actually connect with each other. Like people you would never sit down and try to have a conversation with, but you got a lot in common. You just don't realize it. I'm starting to understand now, as the more I write about it, what the 80s and 90s meant. I didn't understand it at the time. We were young. I'm 42. We, we really did come of age at the same time. Different cities, different neighborhoods. Um, but part of telling the story, especially like my part of the story, was thinking about like what were the, you know, the historic influences and, and um, you know, trends that were affecting my life and I didn't even know it. I just thought, oh my God, why is everything so messed up and this isn't fair and that sort of thing. That's how it felt at the time. I, first I want to thank you both for an extraordinary presentation. Um, this question is for you, Corey. Um, and I hope I can pull together these thoughts. Um, one of the things that, one of the privileges that being here as a student at Yale, which believe it or not, I am as well an undergraduate, um, confers on us is that we are given the stamp of approval. We are given um, a sense that our, our words are going to matter and will be paid attention to. And your, your story, your extraordinary story, will now be heard as it absolutely should. I want to ask you, if Kiara had not found you, tracked you down, sat you down, I mean, others did, Democracy Now!, many other places, but those are very fleeting, the news today over tomorrow. Did you, where would your story, how would your story have been preserved? And did you recognize within yourself that you're a hero? I, you know, we all, you know, we, we've been trained to sort of know, oh, there's a story, I'm gonna write a play, I'm gonna make a painting, I'm gonna do a mural, I'm going to uh, write a book. I find myself thinking today that the world is 
celebrating, marking, mourning the death of a 41-year-old man who is acknowledged as a heroic African-American figure, and in certain ways, that's obviously true. But to me, you're the 41-year-old the African-American hero whose contribution is enduring in, in this most powerful way. Would you have simply gone back to the dining hall and never felt a need to, never felt that your story had to go out into the world? Well, I'm a journalism major. Okay. okay? Yeah. So I have writing ability. I'm also a huge procrastinator. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> the story is already written in my heart and in my mind. It's just a matter of sitting down, writing the story, and presenting it to the masses. But you were going to make sure that happened, right? Yeah, one day. Oh. <laughs> He's been saying that from the first time we talked. He's like, I want to write a book. I want to write, you know, it's like, I, I forgot to ask you last time we spoke, but you had been talking about like potentially writing a play, you know, so, <laughs> you know, being a procrastinator just is an, another qualification for being a writer. So, um, I think, I, I think uh, one more question and then we have a, a reception. There's going to be a reception afterwards, so I, we can keep, ha keep the conversation going. It's on? Yeah. Hi. I'd like to thank you both very much. It's a very moving presentation. My question is the instant that you broke the window, what was going through your mind? I imagine that I project on you that, that it was very complicated, or was it sort of a blind, rash, impulsive time? It was, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off. It was very impulsive. Um, you know, the guys, uh, the, 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 the reunion alum who pointed it out to me, that happened like a Sunday. And uh, I came back to work Monday. And I did it on Tuesday. So it was a, uh, that sounds fast, but it was a couple of days where it was like, I don't know. You got kind of, I don't know. I don't want to like sound like I'm crazy, but in your mind, you go through the should I, should I not. And um, in my mind, I always convinced myself, no, don't be stupid. Why would you, no, just no. But in that moment, something just overcame. And um, we had a nine, a, a 10, 10 o'clock break, break, a 10 minute break, excuse me, from nine to nine, 10. And it was in that moment, in that time, I just was like, you know, yeah, that thing needs to come down. <laughs> and I just did it impulsively. Um, I obviously didn't think about my children or my own well-being, because if I had, I probably would not have done that. But uh, I have a lot of knowledge, but I don't always go off of the, what's the word, the uh, intelligence of situations. Sometimes I go off the, the heart feeling. You know, how does it make me feel? What do I really need to do in this situation? You know, sometimes situations call for you not to do the most logical thing in order to accomplish things. That was one instance, and it just happened to work out for me. It could have been disastrous. I could be on the street begging for money right now. You never know. But God had my back, and he made sure everything uh, worked out for me. And to him, I'm, I'm, I'm most grateful. I think that's a beautiful place, actually, to end and keep the conversation going out in the reception. So thank you all. Thank you, Corey. <laughs>